Hi, the premise of this video is simple. We're gonna do 24 FANG coding interview questions. And as I solve them, I'll be explaining my live thought process and the solutions that I come up with. And I'll also walk you through my process of coding the solution so you can see both the solution itself and how I came up with it. And this video is designed for guided practice. So if you're trying to get good at coding interviews, you can try these questions out for yourself. And if you get stuck, you can learn from the solution and the code and also understand how to come up with it for yourself. So as for the questions themselves, Netflix doesn't really ask lead code style questions, so I'll leave out Netflix. That leaves four companies, and for each one we'll do two lead code easy, two medium, and two hard. So four companies, six questions each, 24 total. And that way, wherever you are in your interview journey, there'll be at least eight questions at a difficulty that's reasonable for you to try out. And if you're wondering who I am and why I'm qualified to do this, I'm a pretty good competitive programmer, and I've done stuff like some of LeetCode's hardest questions. And I'm also from the future, so I can guarantee that I was able to solve everything and that there'll be stuff to learn from this video. I'll put everything, timestamps time stamps to skip around, the questions, my code, and the sources of the FANG list in the description. And just a note, I don't have LeetCode Premium, so I'm not giving out any information that wasn't already publicly available. And with that disclaimer out of the way, that's all for the intro. Let's get started. All right, this is Facebook Easy One. Um, given an unsorted array of integers, return the length of the longest continuous increasing subsequence. Subsequence must be strictly increasing. And a continuous increasing subsequence is, yeah, okay. It, it's exactly that. All right, so how do we do this? So let's start off by just imagining an array. Say, for example, one, three, five, four, seven. Now, what we can do, and this is sort of common with subarray problems, is to find the longest subarray satisfying some condition, um, we have to ultimately iterate over the values L and R of the subarray, like the left end and the right end. So what we can do is, because the numbers are up, the length is up to 10 to the fourth, and that could take a while, what we can do instead is we could fix one of these boundaries. So we could, for example, say we can iterate over L, and then we can try and find the, the largest R that satisfies the condition. So for example, we can find, like if this is the left end of the subarray, then what's the farthest to the right we can get an R that satisfies it? Because that will give us the longest subarray. Or we can iterate over R and find the longest and find the smallest value of L, as in the farthest value that will give us the longest subarray. So it's a matter of just personal preference, whichever you choose to do here, but I'm gonna go with R since it sort of lends itself naturally. So we're gonna fix some R and we're gonna try and find the the smallest possible L, rather the longest possible subarray. So to do this, let's see what we can do. So if we iterate over R, then we can easily just iterate over L, and then while, while it's still strictly increasing, while the subarray is still strictly increasing, we can just, um, we can just do that. So we can iterate over R and then lower L until we get a subarray that isn't strictly increasing anymore. And then at that point, we know that's the smallest possible L. But another thing we could do is, instead of just iterating over L every time, we could be a bit smarter. Because any part of a long, any part of an increasing subarray is in itself increasing, if we know the answer for the previous R, then or like, think of it a different way. Let's imagine the answer for this R. If, if the previous element is less than it, then we already know, then we already know if this was the R, we already know the farthest we can go to the left such that it would still be increasing. So we know the answer for this R. And if we consider the answer for this R, uh, if we consider the answer for this R, it can't, the L can't possibly be lower to the left because if it was, then the answer for this R would be smaller. So the answer for this R is entirely dependent on the answer for this R. And therefore we can figure out the answer to this R just by figuring out the answer to this one. And in particular, they're the same answer. So the, the smallest possible L for this R is the same as the smallest possible L for the previous R 
if this value is lower. If we have something like this, where four is less than five, then the smallest possible subarray is just this element itself because you can't go left any farther. But for values where the previous element is less than it, the smallest possible L is the exact same. So the smallest possible L carries over, essentially. So ultimately, after all of this, what this means is the answer for this R is one greater than the answer. The answer for this R is one greater than the answer for this R because it's the same L, but it moves over one. So what we can do is we can iterate over R. We can iterate over R. So for example, say R is here. We know since this is the beginning, L is also here as well. So the answer is one. Here we iterate over this R and because this one is less than three, we know that the answer is two because it's just the answer for this plus one because now we just extended the array by an element. We just pushed this element to the back. Now when R is here, we know that the answer for this is just this plus one, so we have three. When R is here, it resets because five is greater. So there, so the, the smallest possible L is just this because you can't go any more to the left. So the answer is one. And then seven, it's the answer for this plus one, so two. And we can figure out the answer for each R, and then we can figure out the answer overall by just taking the largest of all of these individual answers, in which case it's three. So putting that all together, to code it, we can simply for int current r is equal to 0, um, best r is equal to 0. So for each number, uh, no, i is equal to 0, nums.size i++. Plus plus. So if either i is equal to zero or um, this element this element uh, is greater this element is less than the previous element so the previous element is greater then that means we have to reset so current r is equal to one because it means like for example this four and this five the five is greater than the four so the r is reset the l value is reset and otherwise, it's sort of like this 5. This 5 just extends onto the answer of this 3. So we just increment the current answer. And then we take the best. And then we just maintain the best. And then that's our answer. should work. Oh, wait, no. This should be greater than or equal to. Uh, yeah. Because it has to be strictly increasing. So if we had another 5 here, it would also reset, because the 5, this is not a valid subarray. OK. And there we go. So we can just do that. Nice. All right, this is apple easy one you are given the heads of two sorted length lists, and you want to merge the two lists together into a single sorted list. The list should be made by splicing together the nodes of the first two lists. Turn the head and the merge length list. Okay. Um, all right, so let's just implement how we would do this. So we start off with a choice. So we know that both lists are sorted. We're given that. And what that implies is the smallest, the smallest element of this red list is going to be at the beginning of the list. And the smallest element of this blue list is going to be at the beginning of the blue list. Which means that when we're looking for the smallest element out of both lists, we know that the smallest element is either going to be the first element of this list or the first element of this list. So what, what that means is, essentially, all we have to do to find out the first element of our sorted list is to, all we have to do to find the first element of our sorted list is to figure out which of the two smallest elements is smaller. In this case, it's a tie, so it doesn't really matter. So we can just take either one. So let's take the top one, because why not? 
So take the top one and this. So now again, this list is still sorted because we just removed the first element so it doesn't break the sorted property. So now once again, we ask um, which, of these, which of these smallest elements is smaller? In this case, it's this blue one, so we take the blue one. Now, which of these smallest elements is smaller? It's the two, so we take the two, and so on. And we take the smallest elements from each list until we're done. Um, yeah, so essentially, that's basically it, I think. We just take the smallest elements from each list until we run out of elements. And I don't think there's much more to say. Yeah. So we just have to implement this. Um, list node result is equal to new list node. So we keep track of the answer. We can also keep track of the current tail of the linked list because we can, um, yeah, so we can keep track of the head and the tail. Head. Um, how do we exactly keep track of this? And this can initially be null pointer. All right, so let's just do the edge case. If list one is equal to null pointer and list two is equal to null pointer, um, we can just return null pointer. Otherwise, this head will be something. So new list node. Yeah. Now, while list one is not equal to null pointer. So while we have an element in either of the lists, what we do is we take the element. So Um, okay, so if list one is equal to null pointer, then we immediately, so if list one is empty, then we immediately take list two. Um, so head val is equal to list two val. Um, no, tail. Okay, what do we want to do exactly? We want to like, we want to want to merge this in such a way that like, we don't want to create an empty node at the end. Right? So how do we how do we do this? So we we create a new node. List node cur is equal to new list node, I guess. Um Okay. So list node cur is equal to two new list node. So cur val else if list two is equal to null pointer, then we immediately take list two is empty. Take list one, else if list one now is smaller, then we take list one's value, else, and just copy this. So yeah, this is kind of messy, but I think it ends up working. So if list one's empty, take from list two. If list two's empty, take from list one. Otherwise, take the smaller. Now. If head is equal to null pointer, head is equal to cur. If tail is equal to null pointer, tail is equal to cur. Otherwise, tail 
next is equal to cur. Uh, tail is equal to cur. Yeah. So we it's so if so if the head is currently nothing, set the head to be the current. If the tail, do we really need? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So if the tail is equal to no pointer, then set the tail to be current. And otherwise, set the next node of the current tail to be current. So we attach this to the end of the linked list, and then we set the end of the linked list to be this. And then we return head. And this should work. Nope. Uh, why? Line 35. Run timer, member access, so they misalign the draw. What does that mean? So tail. Just like print tail. Let's see what happens. Okay, so tail is a thing. Um, so why tail is equal to cur, otherwise tail next is equal to cur. So what am I missing? I don't understand. So tail is not no pointer specifically. So what is happening? Like, what does this mean? This isn't helpful. So I do this. This is the problem, right? I mean, it should get wrong answer after that. Time limit exceeded. Oh, that's why. List two is equal to list two next. Right, so we need to advance the lists, yep. Okay, that is a thing that we should do. Now maybe that fixes it, not sure. We run out of memory. Okay, I'm very confused by this. What the hell is happening? Wait, how? How does it get half the list? Okay, I'm so confused. What is happening right now? So is the problem accessing a member of tail or, or what? I'm so confused. What is happening? Like what? I'm, I'm doing something very dumb here. Do I just need to... I need to like explicitly... Okay, I'm, I'm not actually that familiar with pointers. So maybe I'm just doing this dumb. So we need to like explicitly say that it's that. Yeah, okay. All right, so that's that comes down to inexperience. I did not know it had a garbage value, so that's fair. All good. It should work now. Okay. Okay, this is Amazon Easy One. Let's get started. So you're given two strings S and T. T is generally generated by random shuffling string S and adding one more letter at a random position. Okay. Um, Okay, probably the 
I guess the easiest way to do this is to just keep a count of characters. So like if we have a count of A is equal to 5 in S, or like 2 in S, and if it's equal to 3 in T, then immediately we know that we have an extra A. So that's one way of doing it. Just keep a count of characters. And then, um, yeah. And specifically, the number of characters in T, the number of A in T, minus the number of A in S, will be equal to 1 if they're different, or 0 if they're the same. So that makes it actually very simple. For each character, we just figure out the difference between the frequency in T and the frequency in S. And that way, um, and we just figure out which one's 1, and then return that. Uh, that should be simple. So we just, we just do that. So uh, vector int freak. So for car C S, we subtract each character from S. So freak C minus A is equal to minus minus. Yeah. So subtracting A in this case makes it um, subtracting A will like. Since characters are really just numbers, subtracting a will actually just map it from a to a number between 0 and 25. So for example, a minus a is 0, z minus a is 25, and anything in between is just the order of the alphabet. So this is just sort of a C++ trick. Um, there are other ways to get the, do this sort of thing, like in Python and stuff like that. Ultimately, it just comes down to getting the number value of the character and subtracting a. And then we do the same thing, C minus A plus plus, and then for each character, we figure out the one that's extra, and if freak i is equal to 1, return, and then same thing, we add a in this case, and then we just add the offset. So for example, if, if we added 3, then we would get the character d. If we added 0, then we would just get a itself. So we're doing characters are secretly numbers, so we can just work with that. OK, this should be fine. I mean, it's going to always return. It's just C++ is being safe about it, which is fine. So yeah, this should work, and we're good. Nice. All right, here we have Google Easy One. You're given a large integer represented as an integer array digits, where each digit i is the ith digit. The digits are ordered from most significant to least significant. Okay, increment the large integer by one and return the resulting array of digits. Okay. Um, all right, so. I guess the annoying thing is if it's so when we have a nine, like this is how we how how would we normally do addition? Like when we have a nine, um, we would carry the one. This I drew this badly. When we have a nine, when we add a one, we get a zero here, and then we would carry it and then add it to the next nine and then carry it until we stop carrying, until we run out of nines. Um, if we have any other digit, like for example, 97 plus 1, then it's really simple. We just add to the 7, and, the, and then we're done. So ultimately, we have to carry. Um, and the annoying thing is, if if the digit, I think this is the only edge case, if the string is all nines, then we have to add on a digit. We have to make it like 100, for example. But other than that, we can just do the standard process of addition. We would just add one to it normally, and we would carry the one if necessary. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what this wants. They just want you to do standard addition. We just have to have this special edge case of all nines. So 
true all nine. Yes, false. True. Or int x digits. If x is not equal to nine, all nine is equal to false. So if all nine, then I don't actually know how this works. Uh, okay. For int x. So we set them all to zero, and then digits zero is equal to one. So we basically just add an extra digit, and then we, we would just like, we would just make it a one followed by a bunch of zeros, followed by the same number of zeros as the number of nines. Else, we go from the back, dot size minus one ice cream equals zero i minus minus um digits i plus plus if digits i is equal to 10 digits i is equal to zero else we break breaking means we're done we don't have to carry anymore but if it's 10 then we shouldn't break because we should move on to the next digit and add one to it uh It should work as expected. Okay, I don't actually know how insert works, but I think it's this. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, all right, this is Facebook easy too. We have some email addresses, okay? Every valid email consists of a local name and the domain name, the size of lowercase letters, the email may contain one or more dot or plus. If you add periods between some characters, mail sent there will be forwarded to the same address without dots in the local name. Uh, okay. Note that this rule does not apply to domain names. Uh, if you add a plus in the local name, everything after the first plus sign will be ignored. Note that this rule does not apply to domain names. Okay, so we parse. Um, okay, so. Essentially, what we need to do is parse the string. So we, first thing we can do is separate local and domain. So to do that, we can just iterate until we hit the at symbol and then put everything in that first part to the local string. And then we can just add the at symbol and then put everything else in the domain string. Um, okay, now next thing we do is we iterate until we hit a plus sign. And then that way we can put everything to the left of the plus sign in the new local name, and then we can get rid of everything else, regardless of what it is. And then once we have this new local name, what we have to do is we have to filter out the dots. So we can just add everything but the dots to this final domain name, or this final local name, and then that should be good. So essentially we parse, we parse out the local name, we parse until we get the plus, and then we get rid of the dots. Um, so we're basically just doing what the problem says. So let's just see. String local is equal to empty. Domain is equal to empty. Um, each email contains exactly one add character. Does it matter dot com? I don't think it does, right? Test email plus Alex. Okay. Yeah, all right. So what we do is for, no, wait, we need to parse each email separately. Okay, so once we do this, then we have this parsed local email, and then we stick it back in the at symbol. We stick back the domain. 
And then we can put all of these into some sort of hash set so that we can keep track of the number of unique names um, or unique emails. So we just get the so we just get the like the the parsed email after the rules, and then we put it in the set, and then we count the number of different elements in the set, which the set will automatically do for us. So we can do like unordered set string uh, email set, and then for string email emails, so for each email, string local is equal to that, domain is equal to that. For each character in the email, Um, okay, so I'm going to do all three of these rules at the same time. So first things first, if we encounter a dot, simply do not, whoa. Okay, if we encounter a dot, simply don't process. When we encounter a plus, stop adding to local. And once we encounter the at symbol, switch to domain. Okay. This would be nicer to do in Python, but whatever. <clears throat> so for each character, if C is not equal to a, no wait. So, bool local equals true. So if C is equal to the at symbol, then local equals false. Else if and then don't process any further. Otherwise, if local, then if C is equal to a plus sign, then before plus is equal to true. And if C is not equal to the dot, then that means we should process it. So if C is not equal to dot, and if before plus is, all right, no, this should be false, because now we are after a plus. So if before plus is true, that means we haven't hit a plus sign yet, then that means we should still process this character. So we can say local plus equals this character. Um, yeah, so else, otherwise, otherwise we're in the domain, so domain plus equals C, then string final is equal to local, I think, yeah, Loc is final a keyword is equal to local plus the at symbol plus domain. And then we can put the email in the set. And then return it. Final email set dot size. We can also do a bit of debugging. String s email set cls that. Just print each email in the set just to see what it comes out to. Because we probably made a mistake, I don't know. Uh, uh yeah. in local, sure. Test email at leetcode.com and test email at leetcode.com. Okay. Yep. All right. Seems legit. Could have made a mistake, but whatever. We'll see. Looks like no. Nice. All right. This is Apple Easy 2. Best time to buy and sell stock. 
So you're given the right prices, where price is I is the price of a given stock on the eighth day. You want to maximize your profit by choosing a single day to buy a stock and choosing a different day in the future to sell that stock. Okay. Um, all right. So similar to the first Facebook problem, what we're going to do is we're going to pick some ending point. We're going to pick some day to sell on. We're going to pick some day to sell on. Let's call it S. Let's say, for example, we sell here. And we're looking for a buy point. In particular, we're looking for a buy point before. So out of all the indices to before for this particular sell point, which one is the buy point that we should use? So that's the question. And the answer is, well, we need to figure out what the benefit we'll get is. So if we sell on this day, if we sell if we sell, like let's say the, the price we sell on is AS, then what happens is we buy at price AB, meaning we spend AB in the beginning, so we get negative AB, and then we sell, so we gain, a, we gain AS. So the overall profit is AS minus AB. So we're looking for, in essence, the smallest value of AB so we can maximize this, this statement. Since AS is already constant, so really, we're just looking to, we want to maximize negative AB, which means we want to minimize positive AB. So you want to minimize AB. So in essence, we're looking for the minimum value before this current um, stock. And that's all we really need. For each ending point, all we, for each selling point, all we need to do is find the minimum value before this selling point so that we can find the minimum value of AB and find the maximum value that we can get by selling this stock on this day. So how do we do that? We can just keep track of a running minimum. The minimum of 0 to i is the minimum of the minimum of 0 to i minus 1 and ai just because just because this is 0 to i minus 1, and this is ai, or rather this is i, and then this is 0 to i. So we just add on one element. So we can keep track of this running minimum as we go along, and then we can essentially for each sell point, we can just find out the best buy point. So let's do that. Um, okay, so the prices are up to 10 to the 4th, so we can initialize the running min to like 10, 10 to the 9th or something, just some huge value that like we would never actually use, and then int best profit is equal to 0, we can initialize to 0 because that's our return value anyway, so for int price prices, first thing we do is we minimize this equation. So int best selling here is the current price, which is AS, minus the minimum value of B, which is the running minimum. And then we can we can essentially like update our best profit. So best profit equals max best profit and the best selling here. And then we can update our running min. So our running min can be set to the minimum of itself and the price. So we keep track of this running minimum as we go along, and we try to minimize this equation for every selling point. And then we return best profit. And that should be all. Cool. All right. All right. This is Amazon Easy Two. Um, yeah. So given two strings S and goal, return true if and only if S can become goal after some number of shifts on S. A shift on S consists of moving the leftmost character of S to the rightmost position. 
Okay, so if S is A, B, C, D, E, let me move the left so it becomes B, C, D, E, A. All right. So, okay. So first things first, there is a function in C++ called rotate that does exactly this. It will shift the string by some number of characters. Um, in particular, we can keep rotating by one, so we can try all possible shifts until we hit the right shift, or we determine that they're not together at all. But that's kind of um, cheesy, I guess. So we can we can do it a normal way as well, and we're going to use the same basic algorithm. Algor well, algorithm. Essentially, we're going to try all possible shifts because there isn't really a better way to do it. Well, there is, but very advanced. Um, so, essentially, for example, A, B, C, D, E. We can try all possible shifts by just doing a rotation. So, for example, we could try B, C, D, E, A. We can try C, D, E, A, B. And we can try just each of the possible shifts. Because essentially that's our goal. We're trying to see if there is some shift that's equal to our final string. So if we try all possible shifts, then that's, that's, we're checking all possibilities. So it remains to just figure out how we can easily shift a string. And one way to do that is to just move A to the end via a sequence of swaps. Um, it basically, as defined in the statement, it just says moving the leftmost character of S to the rightmost position. So for example, if we want to move A, so if we want this to become B, C, D, E, A, what we can do is we can move A one place over. Then we get, we can move, yeah, we can move A one place over. Then we get B, A, C, D, E. Then we can move A another place over. We get B, C, D, no, B, C, A, D, E. And note that, when we're moving these over, we're shifting every character except for A, one to the left, because we're going to swap it with A, and we're therefore going to move it one to the left. So B, C, D, A, E, and then B, C, D, E, A. So every character that's not A gets moved one to the left, and, every, and A itself gets moved all the way to the right, as you can see. So that's ultimately what we're doing with a shift. We're moving every other character one to the left so that A can move to the right. So to implement, to implement this, we can simply swap A. We can simply swap A with every character until A gets to the right. Kind of like bubble sort, where we just bubble one of the one of the numbers to the beginning or the end, however it works. Um, yeah, so we just swap A until it gets to the end, and we're basically just implementing rotate itself, and then rotating ourselves. And then we can, at every point, we can check the rotation with the target string and we can see if it works. So, so for int rotations equal to zero, rotations less than s dot length, rotations plus plus. If s is equal to goal, return true. Otherwise, do a rotation. So four into i equals zero, i plus one is less than s dot length, i plus plus, swap si, si plus one. And note that this is gonna do the rotations in this exact order. It's gonna do this one first, then, or it's, yeah, it's gonna do the swaps in this exact order. This one first, this one second, this one third, and fourth. And you can verify that it will ultimately move a all the way over and move the rest of the characters left by one. And then if after all that, we don't find a match, then we return false. Yep, okay. So it should just work. Nice. All right. All right, this is Google Easy 2. And the statement is very simple. Given two binary strings A and B, return their sum as a binary string. Okay. Um, each string does not contain leading zeros. That is useful. A and B consist only of zero or one characters. All right, so this is actually kind of similar to the previous Google one. Essentially, essentially we're just going to do normal addition. So for example, 1010, 1011. 
we can do normal addition. So 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So we carry a 1, so we carry this 1, so now we get that. And we carry this 1, so we get 0 here, but we carry a 1 to get this. Um, yeah, so that should work. Um, but the carrying is not as straightforward as the previous one. So we may just, um, probably the easiest way to handle a carry is just to do it explicitly. So if we, we process from smallest to largest and we add and we carry, and if we notice that we have a carry at the end, then we can just insert another character in the beginning in the final string. Yeah. Um, or rather, probably an easier way to do it actually is just to like reverse the strings. So we go from smallest to largest. And that way, the way we handle these is we just sort of, um, we just sort of do it naturally. So we maintain the carry as we go along. And then that way we can just, it's inserting at the end instead of the beginning, which is probably easier. And then we can reverse it at the end. In this case, it's, in this case, it's symmetrical, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, palindrome, that's the word. So yeah, I think we just, we just do it essentially. So let's reverse both strings. And then uh, string C. So also what we can do is um, to add on, this is the normal string. We can just pad the smaller string with zeros so that they're both the same length, which is just kind of convenient. So while a dot length, less than b dot length, a dot push back zero, do the same for b. Note that we're operating with the reverse strings, so pushing zeros onto the end is actually putting, putting zeros onto the beginning. Okay, now for int i equals zero, i is less than length, a plus plus. Int carry is equal to zero. So we can do a for loop like that. If int current is equal to carry. So we're just going to compute the sum for this specific character. If i is less than a dot length. So if we're not out of bounds, like we could be out of bounds if we have this extra carry, but if we're not, then cur plus equals a i minus zero. Uh, this is just doing arithmetic with, because characters are secretly numbers, subtracting zero will give it the actual value of zero if it's zero or one if it's one, plus equals v i minus zero. So int remainder is equal to cur mod two, int, and then carry is equal to cur divided by two. Note that this is floor division, could be different in something like Python. And then so c dot push back rem plus zero. No, rem plus, yeah, zero. So if rem is zero, it'll push zero. If rem is one, it'll push one. Then return c. No. We reverse C first, then return C. Okay, yep, so we're just doing addition. At this stage, we compute the value at this digit, and then we have some extra carryover if we need to. Note that carry will always be at most one, so it shouldn't be an issue at all. It should be fine, yeah. All right, nice.
All right, this is Facebook medium number one. Find minimum in rotated sorted array. Okay. Suppose an array of length n sorted in ascending order is rotated between one and n times. Notice the rotating an array one time results in the array. Yep. Okay. Um, given the sorted rotated array of unique elements, return the minimum element in this array. Okay. So essentially, Okay, so essentially we have an array that behaves like this. Noting that this is a distinct line. Let's add color. There is no overlap between this. And it says we need login time. Okay. So yeah, so this is so this is what a rotation is going to do. It's going to take a chunk of this and to move it over here, which means we're going to have an array that looks like this, like this. So what we need to do is we need to find the lowest point here. So what can we do? Um, well, OK, so. If we find this middle point, the point where it goes from high to low, also noting the fact that the array elements are unique, so that's kind of a thing. Um, if we find this middle point, then we immediately know the minimum. It's just the point right after the middle. So if we were design, if we were to design some sort of binary search, because binary search is just what you do on sorted arrays, then we could find this middle point and therefore the minimum. So. We know that um, we know the first element. We know that the first element is this. So we know that anything to the left of this red line is going to be greater than or equal to the first element. And anything to the right of this middle line is going to be less than the first element. And that should be enough to give us a binary search condition. We just we just check. We just binary search on the whole array, and we find the first index that's less than the first element. And that should just work, I'm pretty sure. That's all we need to do, right? We just find the first index that's less than the first element. Um, yeah, OK, binary search, let's go. So int l equals 0, r equals n while l is less than r, int m is equal to l plus r over 2. If nums m is greater than or equal to num 0, then it means our middle, our estimate is too far to the left, meaning that we have to move to the right. So l is equal to m plus 1. Otherwise, our estimate is either exactly spot on or too far to the right, which means that we set r equals m then return now. And this is pretty simple. Should work. Uh, Nums that size. Okay. We don't use n anywhere else. Should be fine. We need to return the array element. Nums l. This will crash. Yeah, OK. Um, wait. OK, we can, we can have an exception here. If nums 0 is less than nums, nums.size minus 1 return num0. That means that the array was not rotated at all. Because if the array was rotated at all, then, then we would have an array that looks like this, and therefore the last element would be less than the first element. So if the last element is greater than the first element, then the array was not rotated. But otherwise, it has to have been rotated. So that should be fine. 
Yeah, okay. So that'll crash. Yeah, it'll only crash on a non-rotated array. Other than that, it should be fine. Yeah. Okay, seems good. Um, I hate myself. I need to check edge cases more. This is a very common thing. There we go. Okay. Sure. So single binary search, fine. Okay. This is Apple Medium 1, min stack. And it seems like we're doing a lot. So we need to design a stack that supports push, pop, top, and retrieving the minimum element in constant time. Okay. Um, should be simple, right? So say, for example, we have like three two, five, one on the stack. This is our order. So what we can do is we can just store like for each element, we can store kind of like a running minimum. Like so. And then, um, so this is like the minimum of every element before it on the stack. And then when we push an element onto the stack, say for example, we push negative one, then we the element we push is the minimum of this and this, because this is the minimum of everything before it representing this, and this is this element. So combined, we get the minimum of everything. So we can just push negative one onto that. And then when we pop, popping is really simple because this is already at the top of the stack. If we keep like another stack that represents this, then this is already at the top of the stack. So we can just pop this and pop this. Um, and everything else is just standard. Everything else is standard, so this should be good. So we keep this running minimum, which is again the minimum of every element before it in the stack. That should be fine. Oh, also, we don't need like get min to get the minimum. We just keep track of like ev everything, everything in the stack. Um, and the reason this is so easy is because now when we need the minimum of this, then we can simply, like when we pop an element, since we're keeping track of the minimum of like every possible prefix of the stack, when we pop an element, we already know the minimum of everything without this element, since we already stored that. So in short, keeping a running min solves everything. That should be fine. Okay, so stack int values minimums. So values dot push val if int prev min is equal to val if minimums dot size. Is this a thing? Mums dot empty. Prev min is equal to minimums dot top. Minimums dot push min prev min val. So this is just storing the minimum of the entire stack. Values dot pop. Minimums is really annoying to type out with my typing style. Uh, return values.top, return minimums.top. Should be good. Compiler. Uh, did I miss an S? I did. Okay, yeah. So this is basically saying get the minimum of the previous element of minimums and the value. Should it just work? Yeah, okay. So in short, running minimums, OP. That's it. All right, this is Amazon medium one. And we have a grid where zero is an empty cell, one is a fresh orange, or two is a rotten orange. Every minute, any fresh orange that is four directionally adjacent to a rotten orange becomes rotten. Turn the minimum number of minutes that must elapse until no cells of fresh orange. If this is impossible, return negative one. 
Okay. Um. All right. So, what we can do is, so we have this grid. Let's say, let's say this is rotten. Um. So like orange. Okay, and like pink is rotten. So we have some stuff like here. And we have maybe some stuff here. All right, so what will happen is after turn one, everything adjacent to this um, everything adjacent to something rotten will be turned rotten. Then in turn two, everything adjacent to something rotten will be turned rotten, and so on. So this alone, because M and N are up to 10, this alone is enough to simulate the process. We can just, like, we can just four, we can just, like, four each moment in time for everything that's rotten simulate one turn so simulate it changing the adjacent things into rotten um, and that would be fine but I don't want to do that because we can do better um, so the thing is when something that's rotten it turns zero so like Let's just label each thing with the turn that it's going to become rotten. So this is rotten in turn zero, this is zero, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is two. The thing is, on turn two, we've already we've already applied the rottenness of the things that were rotten on turn zero, which means we don't need to do it again. So what that means is we can do it in such a way that every rotten cell is processed at most once and then never again. And this would help significantly in a case like, for example, where we have orange everywhere, all over, all over here, and then we have this cell. Because this would take O of n to the fourth because each rotten cell we processed up to O of n squared times, and there are O of n squared cells, so that could be bad. But if we only process this on the turn that it becomes rotten, and then we only process this on the turn that it becomes rotten, and so on, then we process each cell at most once, and therefore it becomes O of n squared. So it remains to figure out how we can implement this smoothly, and Probably the simplest way is just to keep track of. Probably the simplest, yeah. Probably the simplest way is just to like, when something becomes rotten, put it in the queue, and then, um, and then like just process it as the next turn. Um, so that's like that's the way to do it. But you can notice after if you think about it for a while. You can realize that this is essentially equivalent to running a BFS every turn, right? So for like on turn zero, we're essentially going to BFS a single step from from both from all the oranges that are rotten on turn zero, and then on turn one, we're going to BFS from all the oranges that are rotten on turn one, and then on turn two, we're going to BFS from all the oranges that are rotten on turn two. And that essentially means that we're doing a BFS where every orange that's rotten on turn zero is the source. We have multiple source nodes. It's called multi-source BFS. So we could note that or this problem is equivalent to doing a multi-source BFS. And that's the way I'm going to implement it because it's probably the easiest way to handle things. But what, what we're essentially doing, the, the simplest way to think about it is we're just we're just pushing the rottenness from everything that's rotten on turn zero to the ones that'll be rotten on turn one. 
and that's turn zero. And then on turn one, we push the rottenness from everything rotten on turn one out to the things that'll be rotten on turn two. Then from turn two, we push we push the rottenness from every orange that was rotten here onto the next wave of oranges, and we just do that at every step. But this is equivalent to running a BFS from every node that's initially rotten simultaneously. Um, both of those ways will work. Both of those ways are ways to think about it. But the BFS is probably just the smoother way to implement it, so I'm just going to do that. And ultimately, it does work in O of n squared because we are pushing out the rottenness. Or because like each, each rotten cell is processed at most once. So there you go. And if anything is never touched, then it's not valid. So vector auto x equal to vector vector int. Now auto dist uh, zero. No, what? Int m equals grid dot size. Int n equals grid zero dot size. Auto dist equals vector vector int n vector int. Nope, this is m. Zero. No, negative one. Okay. Now. Q parent int Q. Four int i equals r equals zero. R is less than m. R plus plus. In competitive programming, usually n is the number of rows, so this might trip me up a bit, but should be fine because usually n and m would be swapped, but whatever. Uh, int c equals 0. So if if it's rotten, grid rc is equal to 2. Um, what do we do? So dist rc is equal to 0, q dot push that. Because again, we're doing BFS with every rotten orange as the source simultaneously. So we're doing BFS from multiple sources. But it behaves identically to normal BFS. We just push multiple things into the queue like on the first turn. This isn't like multi-source BFS is not a mind-blowing trick. It's literally just put multiple things into the queue when we start and then run BFS normally. So while not queue.empty pair int int current is equal to q.front, uh, q.pop, so, okay, uh, const int dr4, const int dc4 is equal to 1, negative 1, 0, 0, okay. Now for each direction, so direction equals zero, direction is less than four, d plus plus. What the hell did I do? Um, int new row is equal to cur dot first plus drd. Int new c is equal to cur dot second plus cd if if these new rows are within bounds so zero is less than equal to new r and new r is less than m and zero is less than equal to new c so new c is between zero and m and new r is between zero and m if grid so if it's if it's an orange at all new r new c is equal to one and if dist um you can you can merge all these three with like and statements but that would be very messy so i'm gonna learn from my past self and not do that new r new c is not equal to negative one which means we have not visited this node yet dist new r new c is equal to dist cur dot first cur dot second plus one, we're one away from our current, so we just reflect that by being one away from our current, that's our new distance, Q dot push that pair.
then final preprocessing um, int answer is equal to zero. Okay, so first off, if we have something invalid, so if grid RC is one and dist RC is negative one, then that means that we have an orange that has never become rotten, so return negative one. Otherwise, if grid RC is equal to one, answer is max, answer dist RC. We don't actually need this if statement. It would work equivalently without it, and you can figure out why on your own, but I'm just gonna do it for clarity. So for each orange that has not, that was not initially rotten, that's, that check if that's our new candidate um, farthest orange. Then return answer. Expecting a lot of compilers, but we'll see. Yeah, okay. Um, why did I type R instead of four? Okay, that's down. Okay, that's fine. Uh, use example tests. So let's do that, and we see we're getting negative one for that, which is not correct. And why is that the case? So we get negative one for everything. No, we get negative one for some things. Grid RC. <coughs> okay, let's just see what happens. What what is happening? So zero comma one. Okay, so that's like immediate. I'm pushing this into the thing. Okay. I'm pushing this into the thing. So what's happening? So zero, 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 zero again. What? Did I? No, I did. DC. New R is within bounds. If grid is one, if dist is not, mm, it should be equal to negative one. Yep, okay. If dist is negative one, then set its distance. There we go. Okay, now I hesitate to say that this is now bug free, but can I just want to try it anyway? Is this a single space? Yeah, okay. All right. Let's just see. Nice. Okay, cool. Okay, this is Google Medium 1. Let's go. Given the root of a complete binary tree, return the number of the nodes in the tree. Ow. Okay. According to Wikipedia, every level except possibly the last is completely filled in a complete binary tree and all nodes in the last level are as far left as possible. You can have between one and two to the h nodes inclusive at the last level h. Not inclusive. Oh yeah, okay, sure. Wait, why? Okay. So every level is completely filled. Um, sure. We need an algorithm that runs in less than O of n. How do we do that? Why do they have values? Wait, why do they have values? Do values do anything or not? Um, do we need to use that information? So the tree is complete. What is n? Is n nodes? Yeah, okay. Okay, so this seems hard to approach because
Okay, we can we can binary search this. We can um, Are we given the depth? No, we're not. Okay. So we can we can first So essentially we're given that some we're given that every level except the last is complete. So we know that for example like all of this is going to be filled. And then what we're interested in is how many nodes are on the bottom. And so what we can do is we can binary search to find out the number of nodes that are on the bottom. So we can say, for example, yeah, we can say, like, we can, we can binary search and, like, say the middle is, for example, um, ow, here. Then, like, we see if this node exists. And if this node, if this node does not exist, then we know that the valid range should be here. And if this node does exist, then the valid range should be here. Yeah, so there we go. Um, that would work. So the question is, can we do better? Because this is, so we do one initial, we do one initial like run down the tree to find the depth. So first thing we do is find depth and then we do binary search. And each binary search level takes O of log. Um, yeah, it takes log because it takes, or it's not log, it's, so find depth, this is O of D. And then we have two to the D or D minus one, depending on how you look at that, um, nodes on the bottom. So binary search is log of two to the D, which is D, specifically log base two of two to the D, which is just exactly D. Um, and it takes O of D to find a node, to check a node, if a node exists. So this is in total of d squared, which is fine. Um, I'm not sure we can do better because oh one and two. Okay, at the last level. Okay, good. So I'm not sure we can do better because like that just that just is um, what we. Like we, we to do this binary search, we need the D fact we need the O of D factor for the binary search itself. And we also need this factor of checking if a node exists. And I don't we can't really optimize that much. We can optimize the constant, but I don't think we can do better than O of D squared. So I think I think it's fine. Yeah, so we just we do binary search on the bottom layer to find out the number of nodes. Okay. Sure. So int depth is equal to zero. So we know that the, the left node is guaranteed to exist. So we know that we can um, find the depth this way. So ow, God, my jaw hurts. So D plus plus depth seeker is depth seeker to the left. And what will this return? So this will return 
one, two, and then it will go down to null pointer, so three. Um, okay. Let's just do some edge cases. So if root is equal to null pointer, return zero. Um, I think we want to we want this to be two, because then we can do two to the two and things are nice. So it should be while def seeker left is not equal to null pointer. And then now that distinguishes these two things. Okay, so. Now we do binary search. So int l is equal to 0, r is equal to 2 to the d. We can do binary search in the binary way, but I don't care. While l is less than r, int m is equal to l plus r over 2. Also, this should be 2 to the d, so 1 shifted by d. d is 5e4. Okay. Um, all right, so if exists m, then l equals m plus 1, which means we need to go to the right, else r equals m. So if exists m, so if 1 exists, then we'll go to 2. Now, if zero exists, then we'll go to one. So yeah, this should be exactly, L should be exactly the number of nodes on the bottom layer. So return two to the D minus one, which accounts for this whole triangle. It accounts for everything that's not on the bottom layer. And then that plus L. So now we need to implement seek. Exists tree node int target tree node uh, root. So I don't think we can do better. I, I don't think we can do better. We need to spend O of D time doing some stuff. Also, we need to um, pass the depth, I think. Just I'll put that. So four and i equals zero I is less than d i plus plus. So we need to like separate these by bits. So if so if like so let's say we're seeking um, like node two in this tree specifically. Like if we number these zero, one, and two, and three, then if we're seeking node two, then we need to go in the right direction. So first we know that this is going to be zero to one, and this is going to be two to three. So we need to find um, which side to go on. So we can do that by essentially, this is going to be, like we can break these numbers down into binary. So for example, this zero is zero, zero in binary, one is zero, one, two is one, zero, three is one, one. Notice that on the right half of the tree, these have this, this greatest bit set. And on the left half of the tree, these bits are not set. And then when we try and find the bits, for example, for the second layer of the tree, we'll notice that this depends on whether the second bit is set. 
So we can use these bits in this fashion to find out whether we should go to the left or the right at every stage. So if target and so if the ith if so if the bit bit is set so this is this is identifying the bit we should use you can just check out the math if you want do that for yourself so target right shift bit and one so this is essentially um, it's some bitwise manipulation if we want to find like if we're if we number the bits like three two one and zero if we want to find the second bit what we can do is shift this by two so that now it becomes we get rid of these two and now it becomes this and then we end it with one which is zero 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 one so everything here will become zero and the only thing that remains is this because this is ended with one, the value will be this specific bit here, which is in this case zero. But if this was one, then this would be a one. So basically what this does is it isolates the bit at the index bit and then ends it with one to check if that bit is set or not. So ultimately, if this is true, then root is equal to root right else root is equal to root left. And noting that because the tree is complete, these nodes are guaranteed to exist. So now all we need to do is return root is not equal to null pointer. That should be good. Yep, uh, depth is two, depth is zero. Yep, perfect, exactly what we wanted. Okay. Nice. Okay, this is Facebook medium two. Let's go. Continuous subarray sum. You're given an integer array nums and an integer k return true if nums has a continuous subarray of size at least two, whose elements sum up to a multiple of k or false otherwise. Okay. Um, okay, so nums, everything fits in integer, nice. Okay, things are up to zero. All right, so first things first. When we're working with anything related to subarray sums, always, 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 first instinct is prefix sums. Um, specifically, yeah, prefix sums. Nothing specific about them. So always, always, always prefix sums. So prefix sums, pi is equal to sum of array elements 0 to i. So 23, 25, 29, 35, 42, right? So the reason we always use prefix, or the reason prefix sums are almost always useful is because to find the sum of l to r, it's only equal to two values, pr minus pl minus 1. And this is a fundamental property of prefix sums, and it's because when we cover an element, when we cover an array, the value 1 to r, subtracting out the value, or subtracting out the value of 1 to l minus 1, gives us exactly l to r. Um, yeah, gives us exactly l to r. And note that it's l minus 1, because if we subtracted pl, then we would exclude the element l, which is not what we want to do. So ultimately, prefix sums are very useful because now instead of looking for the sum of a range, we're only looking at two different values. So using this, let's see what we need to do. We need it to be a multiple of k. So what we need to do is we want pr minus pl minus 1 be a multiple of k. Um, specifically, mod k is equal to zero because that's just definition of divisibility, kind of. Uh, yeah, so pr minus pl minus one, mod k equals zero. In other words, um, pr is equal to pl minus one, mod k. We need their residues mod k to be equal to each other. 
And that's nice because now we're just looking for equal values. Um, so that ends up being very simple, in fact, because now we just need to check if any two elements in the prefix sum array are equal, are equal mod k. Right? So the only the only weird thing is that we need like subarray size at least two, um, which is annoying. But is it annoying? Actually, I'm not sure. It might be exactly what we need. No, I think it, it okay. It's it doesn't really change much. So first thing we do is we compute the prefix sum array. So vector int prefix sum. Uh, okay, so int running sum is equal to zero. This is how I do prefix sums. We just maintain the sum of zero to i as we go because pi is equal to pi minus one plus ai. I will let you figure that out for yourself, but that is basically what we use. So for int i equals zero, i is less than nums that size, i plus plus running sum. Also, we're guaranteed to not overflow, so that's nice. I, uh, right, we're guaranteed to not overflow. Yeah. Prefix sum dot push back running sum. There we go. And I might as well just nums that size, give it a little more speed. I is equal to running sum. Okay, now. We just simply need to check. Also, we can just do this directly. Running sum mod equals k. Because we're checking if two values are equal mod k, so we might as well just do this. Okay, now we can use, for example, an unordered set int. And then that way it'll be O of n, because uh, stuff. Or, yeah. What do I call this? Um, just like, yeah, it's just previous elements. So for int i equals zero, i is less than nums dot size, i plus plus. If previous dot find prefix sum of i, is e not wait not equal to previous dot end. If we found something, then return true. And now we insert let's see. So for we're, we're checking element I. If we're checking element I So basically what we're doing is we're inserting all of the possible p l minus one values into a set. And then when we're checking PR, all we simply need to do is just see if that element exists in the set. Because now we're just checking, is there an l minus one such that PR, this constant value PR is equal to one of these p l minus ones. And that's what a set does for us. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Um, So we need to insert dot insert what? So when we're checking i equals two, we want prefix sum zero to be in. And we want we don't want prefix sum one. So prefix sum i minus one. Because when we're checking one, then we want zero to be in. If i is equal to zero, to insert zero, zero representing um, zero representing p of zero, which is essentially just like 
the the sum is zero because there's no elements there's no elements at all so the sum is just zero so if i is zero then for i being one that means that we want to insert zero yeah otherwise previous dot insert prefix sum i minus one and this should work All I want to do is test two things. Uh, change this to a one, change this to a one. One more thing, change this to a one. Make sure that none of those work. Okay, seems good. Nice, okay. Clean O of N. We're good. Okay, this is Apple Medium 2 Group Anagrams. Given an array of string stirs, group the anagrams together. You can return the answer in any order. Anagram is a word or phrase formed by rearranging the letters of a different. Yeah, okay. So the rearrange. Um, Stirs.length 10 to the fourth, up to 100. Okay. Um, all right, so, so what we want to do with these is to group two things together. So for example, eat, t, eight. For us to be able to determine that these three things are equivalent to each other, we need to like order these in a specific way. Um, we need to order them in a way that'll be consistent throughout like all three of them. So like if all three of these are, if we determine like an ordering for the letters so that no matter what the initial order of the letters was, we can like all three of these, if they have the same letters, then they'll come out to the same string, then like that, will, that would work. So we just need to find a way to order them. And probably the simplest way to do this is just to sort the letters, because that way, no matter what the initial ordering of the letters was, it doesn't matter. The order, the letters will be in the sorted order for every value. So, um, yeah. So sorting, sorting, sorting the letters accomplishes exactly what we want. It it will group two equivalent strings together, and if two strings are not equivalent, then they won't have the same sorted order, so it will be fine, it'll work. So, yeah. So this is probably a common trick you can use for anagram problems. If you sort the letters, then it means that any two letters that, any two words that are anagrams will end up being the same because their set of letters is the exact same. So it's just convenient. Um, so what we can do is we can group these things together by their sorted order. So for example, tan, um, nat, bat. So these end up as ant, ant, uh, abt. And then we just group them together by their sorted order. So eat, t, eight. And then ant has these two, tan, nat, and then abd has bat all alone. Um, yeah, so we just group them by their sorted order. And we can do this using like a hash map or just like anything, really. So if, I, if, if you allow me to show you what I mean, so map or unordered map string vector string map. So for string s stirs. So we create a clone, sort that clone, or sort the characters of that clone. And yes, strings are simply vectors of characters. So you can sort and you can do any operation that you can do on a vector, in case you didn't know that. Um, so sort t dot begin t dot end, then mp of the sorted string dot push back s. And that way we push we group them by the sorted value and we push the original value into the list. So we end up with exactly this. We end up with a list, list of elements grouped by their sorted value or rather grouped by their anagrams. So vector, vector, string, uh, 
answer. So now for pair string vector string. So we just iterate over the map um, group MP for each group. Answer dot pushback group dot second. Return answer. And this should work. Yep. Okay, simple enough. So yeah, common trick for anagrams, sort the characters. And it works out. All right, this is Amazon Medium 2. And here we go. A robot bounded in circle. On an infinite plane, a robot initially stands at 0, 0 and faces north. Note that the north, yeah, north, south, east, west. Um, the robot can receive one of three instructions. Go straight one unit, turn or turn left or right. Okay. Robot performs the instructions given in order and repeats them forever. Turn true if and only if there exists a circle in the plane such that the robot never leaves the circle. Okay. So existing a circle, I think that's I think that's pointless. It's really just does it go on to infinity or not? Because if it stays within a circle, then it'll stay within any other shape too. So really it's just, does it go on to infinity or does it not? Um, so the question is, so let's say it doesn't really matter where the robot's initially facing. So let's just say it initially starts north. Um, so what we do is we need to see if after performing all of its moves, does it end up in the same place? And that's the question. So after performing all of its moves, let's say, for example, it goes here, then turns, then goes, then turns, then goes, then turns, then goes. This is a simple case, and then turns once again. Yeah, so this is a simple case, but ultimately we end up at after performing all the sequences, we end up at zero, zero again, facing north. So the question we have for ourselves is, um, after the initial sequence of moves, are we back where we started? But that's not enough because let's say, for example, we start here go here, go here, and then go here. But this time we're facing south, no, west, right? Um, and that could initially be a problem, but the thing is it won't be because when we, when we do our operations, ultimately we'll end up facing south at zero, zero. Then we'll be right. Pretty sure I got that right, but it doesn't really matter. And then we won't, we won't be back where we started started after the first sequence, but we will be back where we started after four sequences. And so the distinction here is after our first set of sequences, we're no longer at zero, zero facing north, we're at zero, zero facing west. And then we're at zero, zero facing south. And then zero, zero east. And then once again, finally zero, zero north. So it's not just the check of after our first sequence, it's um, after our first sequence, is it, are we done? Are we at the same place where we started? It's after some number of sequences, are we at the same place where we started? But I think, I think it only goes up to four. We only have to check up to four because ultimately, um, Like some sequence will, like ultimately, after four turns, no matter what, will be guaranteed to be facing north again. Because the final outcome for some sequence of turns is either we turn left or right. So let's say, for example, the final outcome for after a sequence of turns is either we, we stay, f okay, I should not use arrows. Either we stay facing north or we turn left or we turn right. In which case, after the next move, we'll turn right again, then we'll turn right again, then we'll turn right again. And after four moves, we'll be north again. 
or we turn left and a similar thing happens. We turn left four times and we end up back at north. Or we end up turning down, but then again, after a single move, we'll be back at north. But the simplest way to handle this is we just check four times no matter what. Because no matter what, after four times, we'll be facing north again. So really what we can do is just execute the sequence of instructions four times. And then we'll be guaranteed to be facing north again. And if we're at the same point that we started, then we're, we're guaranteed to be in a cycle. Because if we, if we end up at the same point where we started after doing a sequence of moves, then all we'll, all we'll do in the future is that same sequence. So no matter what, after every sequence of four sequences, I guess, we'll always end up back at that same point because we're repeating the same sequence of moves over and over again. So really, we just need to check after four sequences, are we at the starting point again? And it doesn't really matter what happens in these intermediate sequences. Like for example, we might end up at the starting point after the first, and we can just stop there. But it doesn't really matter because all that adds is more casework. So we really just, in every case, it's enough to just check are we at the same point after four moves or after four sequences. So let's just do that. So let's just iterate over the sequence. So int pa uh, int x is equal to zero, y is equal to zero. Um, private. So the directions doesn't really matter, but I'll stay true to it regardless, because why not? So const int dx4 is equal to, so north x changes 0, um, east x changes 1, south x0, west x1. Const int dr, again these don't matter, but 4 is equal to, actually, we, should, we shouldn't mix up north and east, for example. We can mix up north and south, and that's fine. But we'll go. So dy, so north, y goes up by 1, uh, east 0, south negative 1, west 0. And then the direction is equal to 0. Just making that clear. Control S. Okay, so four int I for four times. So just iterate four times. Four car C instructions. If C is equal to go, then x plus equals dx d, y plus equals dy d. Else, if C is equal to L, um, we turn to the left, so d is equal to d minus 1 plus 4, or rather d plus 3 mod 4, and otherwise d is equal to d plus 1 mod 4. I'm doing mod 4 just because it makes it simple, because if we, if we go, like if we turn right four times, we'll end up back at north, so it's basically just equivalent to modding. So if return x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. Yep, that should work. Simple enough. Nice. And finally, faster than 100%. Nice. OK, we're here with Google Medium 2. Uh, we have another binary tree problem. Nice. Okay, so thief has found itself a new place for his thievery. There's only one entrance called root. Besides the root, each house only has one and only one parent house. After a tour, the smart thief realized that all houses in this place, yeah, binary tree, will automatically contact the police if two directly linked houses were broken into on the same night. Given the root, return the maximum amount of money the thief can rob without alerting the police. So basically, cannot be... Um, Cannot, yeah, can't rob two adjacent houses. Okay. 10 and the fourth, yep. Okay, so probably 
What it wants us to do is DP, just because it kind of just works. Like just thinking of the options, it seems like DP is right. Um, yeah, so DP, right? So what we want to do is we want to figure out figure out what? I want to figure out if we take this, then we can't take these two. And if we don't take this, then we can take both of these. Um, so the state is the state is just to figure out like given this to like of the trees that or like where this is the root. So DP where this is the root. DP of like node n or n is root. So we're looking for the, we're doing the subtree that this is the root of. That's what I'm trying to say. So DP of this node where this is the root and where this is taken or not. So if we take n, then we cannot take either of these. And if we don't take n, then we can take both of these. And so that is just given by either dp of this and either 0 or 1, depending on whether we can take these or not. Um, and so in typical dp fashion, that's all we really need to think about. We just need to solve it correctly for one node, and then we can use these answers to reconstruct the rest. So we just need, so yeah. So basically we just figure out, do we take this node or not? If so, we have certain cases. If not, then we have different cases. And we just base it off of the previous DP values. So specifically, DP of n and 0 means we don't take this node. It means that we can take DP of left and 1, because we can take left, plus DP of left and 0 or dp of right and 1. But we can also take dp of left and 0, and same for dp of right. So we can just take whichever one's bigger, whichever one's higher. And dp of n1 is straightforward. It's just dp of left 0 plus dp right 0 plus n dot value or n arrow value because it like we can get the value of n as well if we take n um and that should be it so we just do it yeah so private it's always at least zero yeah, so int answer, answer is equal to zero, uh, dp root. So what we do is The first value in this pair is going to be dp current 0, and the second is 1. So what we can do is pair int int the thing we're going to return. So int best left is equal to uh, let's see, if cur is equal to null pointer. Turn zero zero. Int int left is equal to dp cur left. Pair int int right is equal to dp cur right. Int. So 
we're looking for the best of dp left one or dp left zero. So that's best left is equal to the maximum of left dot first, left dot second, just whichever is better. And the best right is similar. And then we, so ret dot first dpn zero is equal to best left plus best right. And ret dot second dpn zero or dpn one is equal to left dot first dp left zero plus right dot first plus cur val. Then answer equals equal to the max of answer and perhaps the first value is better or the second value is better, whichever one. This array notation just means that we're taking the max of these three elements at once. We're creating array and then taking the maximum of that array. Then we return the dp values like so. That should be it. Okay. Uh, seems legit. Nice. All right. That was simple. Tree dp. Just do it. All right. This is the first question Facebook card. Um, let's go. So we have maximum path sum in a binary tree. A path is a sequence of adjacent nodes. Okay. And actually, that's a good way to describe it. A node can only appear in the sequence at most once. Yep. Uh, okay, so the path sum is the sum of value. You want to return the maximum path sum. Okay. All right, so immediately, what do we do here? So the number of nodes up to three, four, that's fine. It's a binary tree, so it can have left or right. And that kind of makes things simple. So we can, for example, draw out this tree. Right, now, what we can do is finding the maximum sum over all paths is equivalent to finding, like to simplify it, instead of finding, instead of like trying to tackle the entire problem of finding the maximum path sum overall, we can just do it for each node individually. So let's say, for example, for this node, we're going to find the maximum path sum of all paths going through this node. So for example, for the ones going through this node, it can be, or let's say where this node is even simpler, where this node is like treating this node as the root. So for example, the maximum path sum in this subtree treating this as the root. So what we can do is there are only a few options for paths to go through this node. Either it goes through this node, or oh, wait, let's say this is the root. So either it goes through this node this way and only goes into the left subtree, or it goes only into the right subtree, or it doesn't go into either subtree, or it goes into both. And if it goes into both, then that means we have some path from some node in this subtree up to here, and then down to some node in this subtree. Um, so this is sort of like a vertical path because it doesn't, so path in a tree, we should note can only go up and then down once. It only has one peak. So if we're saying that this node is the peak, then that means that the left half is only going to go down and the right half is also only going to go down. So if this node is the peak, which we're saying it is, then it's always like it's going to be comprised of two paths that only go down. So we can essentially find the largest or the highest sum vertical path. Let me choose a good color. Uh, the highest sum vertical path, for example, 
that goes through the left, and then the highest sum vertical path that goes through the right, and then combine them. So that sort of gives us our answer. So how do we do this? We want to, yeah. So also worth noting, if some path goes down, it's always going to touch its left child because that's the only way it can go to the left is through this child. And if it goes down this way, then it's going to go through the right child. So what we can do is we can simply store the largest vertical path that goes through this child, and then the largest vertical path that goes through this child. And then we can combine those two largest paths into a path that contains this current root node. It's a bad color. Yeah, into a path that contains this current root node. So overall, what we're trying to do is, for each node, we're going to find the largest sum path that goes through it. So we need the largest sum vertical path in this left subtree and the largest sum vertical path in this right subtree, both of which are connected to the top node of the subtree. So we need to find for each node A, the largest vertical path, like the largest path that only goes up or down. Path, and B, the largest path in general. Then we can use A of the, then we can use the A values of the child to find B, and then we can do that. So to find A, let's see. So for the largest vertical path, either it starts here, either it starts here, or it starts in one of the children. So if it starts in this left child, then it's the A value of this left child plus this node. And if it starts in this right child, then it's the largest vertical path of this child plus the top node. So either way, it's the largest A value in child plus this node. And then B is this. It's the largest A value of children plus this node. My handwriting. Plus this node. Okay, so putting that all together, to code this, we can return a pair. Let's see. Things are up to a thousand. So we can call this like find a b, for example. Tree node current. We can do like answer equals negative 29 just to initialize it. We can also like take the the minimums of these. We can do that. Actually, we don't really need to. Um... Yeah, we don't really need to do that. We can just do this. And then at every node, we'll find the B value, and then we'll update answer with this B value. So let's just do that. So find A value. So int 
best vertical is equal to current val. Current is null pointer, then return zero because uh, that just means we can treat it as an empty path, and empty path has some zero. So let's do left and right. So either it starts at this node, which means it's just current val, or it's this node plus left child, or this node plus right child. This max in brackets just means it's creating an array, so we can do the maximum of this array. So either starting this node this node plus left or this node plus right. Okay, then so this is our this is our a value, this is where we return, and we can do the b value, which is again the largest general path going through this node is equal to So what we're doing here is this b value is going to, it's guaranteed to take this node. And then it might, it might go into the left child as well, or it just might not. So if we do go into the left child, then that represents the value of left. But if we don't, then we can just say that we don't take anything from the left, and therefore we have a path of some zero from the left. Um, that's not a node, that's a zero. So if we have a path of some zero, or rather if left is negative, then we might as well not take left. So we can just say left is zero instead because we don't take anything from left. And the same from right, so that should be good. Then int b value is equal to current value plus left plus right. Answer is equal to max. Answer b value, and then we return a value. OK, so find a b root. And that should just work. OK, let's do these example test cases. Uh, that should work pretty well. Okay, submit. All right, there we go. All right, here we have the Apple question number one, hard. Um, cut off trees for golf event. Okay, so you're asked to cut off all the trees in a forest. The forest is an M, M by N matrix. You can have zero or one that represents a cell that can be walked through. A number greater than one represents a tree that can be walked through, and this number is the tree's height. Okay, you can walk in any of the four directions. If you're standing in a cell with a tree, you can choose where to cut it off. You must cut off the trees in order from shortest to tallest. Um, okay. Starting from the point of zero, zero, return the minimum number of steps you need to walk to cut off all the trees. No two trees have the same height, and there's at least one tree that needs to be cut off. Where do you use? Okay, start at zero, zero. Um, can you, can you walk through zero, zero, guaranteed? Why are you up to 10 to the ninth? Okay, that's just annoying. Um,
and cut off. Okay, so immediately, let's see, M and N are up to 50. So an immediate thing we can think of is we can just kind of brute force it. So like, let's say for convenience that the trees are numbered like two to nine, for example. So what we can do is the order we cut the trees down in is predetermined. We have to go to two, then we have to go to three, then we have to go to four, etc. So what if we just do BFS and find the distance to two to three, and then that's the first distance we have to walk. Or rather, um, we start off at zero, zero. I think I can do this, right? No. Okay. This is not MS Paint. We start off at zero, zero. So for example, here. So the first initial distance we do is we walk to two. And then we have the distance between two and three. We have the distance between three and four. We have the distance between four and five, etc. So we can just, with BFS, find the distance between every pair of nodes. Right? And then, so then we can get these distances in O of 1, and then we can just follow this chain. So from 2 to 3, we find the distance from 2 to 3, we walk there, we find the distance from 3 to 4, we walk there, etc. And at any point, if we encounter something that we can't go through, so for example, we just can't go from 5 to 6, then we conclude that the answer is negative 1. Um, so that should just be a thing. And probably the annoying thing is edge cases. Uh, but actually, we can figure out what they want us to do by looking at this, I guess. So return zero. So let's see, just zero, zero. If zero, if zero, zero is unwalkable, what are we supposed to do? Is it supposed to be negative one? Okay. So yeah, if we can't get from zero, zero to two at any point, then it doesn't really matter. So that should be fine. What? OK, so if 0, 0 is unwalkable, then we can. That's a weird thing to do. But if this is. Okay, you should be negative one. Okay, that's fine. So that that's just, that's just a little clarification, I guess. So we we'll basically just find the distance between each pair of nodes if we can walk there at all, and then we just see. We just see if we can get to everywhere. And I guess that's it, right? That should be it. So we BFS find the distance between every pair, and then for each node in sequence, we just check. And so if the numbers are not conveniently numbered, for example, we have like a 3, and then a 7, and then 11, and then a 50,000, then we can just like sort. We can sort like pairs of like, like we can have 3, and then whatever its cell location is, and then like that. Seven and like two four, for example, and then we can sort this list by the first value, and then we can figure out the list of the pairs of locations that we need to visit. So that should be good, um, and I think that's it. We just BFS distance between every pair, and we just do it. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So.
So this will be the location we need to visit in order. So and that will do that's going to be priority is going to be this list. It's going to be the pair of like the tree number and then the location. So this is, for example, tree num and location. So we sort that and then that should work. So four into i equals zero, i less than four is uh, Is this what they want? Yeah, M by N. Forest zero, that's nice. Okay, um, that's good. Now we can use those. Fix my watch. Okay, I is less than M, I plus plus. So just for each node in the forest. What we can do is if forest ij is greater than one, then we can priority the push back a pair of forest ij and its location. So then sort priority dot begin, priority dot end. Then for whatever this data type is, um, actually we can make this a bit clearer. This would be row. This be column. Yeah, sure. Unless it's not, but yeah, it is. Okay. So for each tree, um, put it into the locations. So now locations will store in order the list of pairs that we need to visit, so that should be good. Um, four int zero lock plus one is less than locations that size lock plus plus. That's what we're doing. We're finding the distance to go from there. So, vector int dists. Now, this is a vector vector of int m. We're creating a distance vector of negative one. from and to. Yeah. So we're going from locations locked, locations locked plus one. So dists from dot first, from dot second equal to zero for from. So while this is standard BFS, we're going to BFS. Front, Q dot top. Then Okay, 
so now q no so cur what we do is we need to do something like this let's do like yeah okay So for each location we can go in, it's new r is equal to q cur dot first plus drd, and new c is equal to cur dot second plus dcd. Um, if valid, new r, new c, mn. So if it's in the grid and if it's not equal to zero, forest new r new c is not equal to zero then we can go here so dist new r and we haven't visited it before dist new r new c is equal to negative one then dist new r new c is equal to dist cur dot first so it's it's one away from our current thing so it's just that plus one and then q dot push new r new c so finally that should be our bfs and now if dist to the node that we're going to is negative one, that means we can't reach it. So we return negative one from the overall function. Otherwise, tote dist plus equals this distance. Since now we add the distance for going from that node from the from to the to. And then we return tote dist. Do I still have that return zero? No. Uh, I know C++, totally. Right. I do know C++. I can verify that I know C++. In fact, I very much do know C++. Come on. Yeah, okay, dist. I think I called it dist everywhere else. That should be fine. Did I? No. Yeah, okay. All right, see if that's all for compilers. Okay, 530. Why is it exactly one off? Why are you exactly one off? Also, why, why exactly one off? I don't understand. Did I not? I didn't push this. Yeah. I need to start at zero, zero. That makes sense. So we should do that. Okay. Uh, I think, I think we're good now. That should be it. I don't know. I'm just going to try it. I don't really care about accuracy. I mean, it could very well be wrong, but whatever. Nice. All right, we're on to hard one from Amazon. Uh, this has a lot of likes, which is good. Given n non-negative integers representing an elevation map, compute how much water it can trap after raining. Okay. Uh, it is two, two, four. Okay. So let's look at this. Um, so let's let's just look at a single column individually. 
since ultimately the answer is like this is not to scale in any way by the way just saying so this is like that and then yeah so ultimately the answer is for each column or it's the sum of water over each column so for example, this contributes one, this contributes one, this contributes two, this contributes one, and this contributes one. So each column independently contributes some amount to the total. So this is a this is a common trick called contribution to sum, where we just figure out at each point, or it's not exactly that, but it kind of is. Like at each point, just individually identify for each point how much it contributes to the total. Um, so that just seems way easier than doing the whole thing. But that's that's kind of what we have to do ultimately, no matter what. So let's just do that. So for a single column, right? So let's say we estimate the water to be x. OK. Now, at what point will water spill? At what point is x too large? Um, I guess x is too large if the water can spill in either direction. Uh, so what does it mean to spill? Like it'll spill if... So what happens when it spills on the right? It'll spill on the right if like it's not high enough. So for example, this is like height like x minus 1. Then it will, let's say there's water over here. This x will spill this way because it's too high. Um, so what about, but what if the height is like x? If the height is x on any of these pillars, then it can't spill because how would it like it, it just can't this is blocking it so an estimate an estimate for this is good if if there's at least one greater than or equal to x pillar to the right and there's at least one greater than or equal to x pillar to the left Okay, so if if that is not true, then x will spill, and therefore x is too high. Um, so that works, but I don't really want to do binary search. So let's not. That's dumb. We can do better than that. What if we just... Essentially, we're looking for the, the largest x such that... There's some pillar to the left that's high enough, and there's some pillar to the right that's high enough. So, is that just like, is it just like the maximum? It should just be the, it should just be the maximum to the left and to the right. So if we find the maximum to the left, and then then that gives us how far we can go before spilling to the left. And the maximum to the right gives us how high we can go without spilling to the right. So let's call this maximum L, and let's call this maximum R, for example. Then what we're trying to do is we're trying to find It'll spill, it'll spill if x is greater than L or x is greater than R. So I guess it's the minimum of L and R. Because if either, if x is greater than either of them, then it'll spill. So it's whichever is smaller that's sort of the bottleneck. Like if, if L is much bigger than R, then we don't really care about x spilling to L, because if x spills to L, then it's already too high for R anyway. 
So I think ultimately it's just the minimum of L and R, where L and R are the maximum to the left and right. So we need to find efficiently the maximum of everything to the left and the maximum of everything to the right. And that should be doable. We just kind of keep like a running max. Because like the maximum, the maximum of 0 to L is equal to the maximum of 0 to L minus 1 and L. So we can just keep track of that running maximum. And then we use L minus 1 and L to transition into 0 to L. And then we do the same thing for right, and then we just kind of keep track of it. So it should be it. We just find left max, right max, and do it. So let's do that. So Also, we should, um, uh, it should be, also we have to take into account the height of like the block itself. So for example, if this is height one and this is too high, then the answer is two minus one. So it's like, it's max of L R, R minus like the height of this cell. So what that means is we can include, let's say for example, like this, we know that the, like for this cell, we know that L is equal to R is equal to two, but we don't want to do two minus three. We want to do three minus three. So for L and R, we might as well just include the cell itself. So L can be like this whole thing, or L can be this whole thing instead of excluding the cell itself. That's the conclusion to draw from that. So overall, that just makes life easier. Um, Okay, my watch keeps falling out, and that's kind of annoying. Uh, so we know height is at most four int i equals zero i plus n i plus plus. So we keep a running max of that. And that's height i. It's the max of everything to the left plus this current one. And then left max i is equal to running max. Running, and then we reset it to go to the right for int i equals m minus one, i is greater than equal to zero, i minus minus. And we just do the exact same thing here. In fact, this is the exact same code. Why are you screwed up? Except this is right max. Um, so this is left, this is right, then int total r is equal to zero for each cell. We just int water here is the minimum of left max and right max. Note that this includes this cell, so we'll never have a negative number since this cell is included in both of them. Um, minus height i, because we have to exclude the water that's already there. Then total water plus equals water here. Okay. Run example tests. Seems legit. 
And, I mean, I don't see what else to do. Seems fine. Keep left max, keep right max. Copying, pasting seems to be fine. And then just find the water here. Should be good, I hope. I hope. Good. All right. All right, this is the first hard from Google. And let's get started. You have an n times n integer matrix grid where each cell is either zero or one. You can move in the four cardinal directions in one step. You want to return the minimum number of steps to go from zero, zero, upper left to bottom right, where you can eliminate at most k obstacles. OK. So we don't need. So removing an obstacle doesn't cost anything. It's simply, OK. So m and n are up to 40, k is up to m times n. So because of that, O of M and K is valid. That's the first thing to note. Um, so that's nice, because that just means, OK, nice that they made this guarantee, because that would be annoying otherwise. So that means, what can we do? We can, so for example, let's say we have like this three by three grid, like the second sample case, except k equals two or something. So these are blocked. So what we can notice is whatever our path is, if we walk through a cell with an obstacle, then we might as well just remove it. Um, so the normal BFS would just have, so if we, if we didn't have obstacles, the normal BFS would be to, um, it would be like O of M N and it would just be go through every cell, every cell and find the distance from zero, zero to the row and the column. So the state we would use is essentially position. It's the distance to go from some starting position to some ending position. But we don't need to limit our state with position. We could, we could expand this state. We could put more things in this state. We could have three integers here, for example. This could be a three tuple instead of a two tuple. And so what if we, like every time we walk through an obstacle, we can just say we remove that obstacle. And that's fine because we're never gonna go, we're never gonna like go through a cell twice. What? We're never gonna like go through a cell twice because that would be dumb. All right, like if we were gonna do this, we would just go here instead. So, or even here instead. So we're never going to go through a cell twice, which means we can basically just, the number of cells with obstacles we go through is the number of obstacles we remove. Um, so in our state, we can essentially create a lot more nodes. So instead of going from some position to some position, now it's also important to keep track of the number of obstacles we've removed. So now, it can be the dist, for example, from 0, 0, 0 to RC1, for example. And these two numbers represent the position, and this number represents the number of obstacles. And then this way, we would go from a position of 0, 0, with 0 obstacles removed, which is our starting node, to some other position with some other number of obstacles removed. And note that this number will always be less than or equal to k, because if it ever goes higher than k, then we can't remove more than k obstacles, so that's kind of just invalid. So that gives us some options to do. Um, so when we, when we do this, when we sort of expand our brains and expand the scope of what we can do with BFS, 
And then this becomes actually pretty simple. It's just 3D BFS. We just, instead of just storing the position, we store an extra, an extra layer, the number of obstacles we removed. And that's, as far as I know, that's it. That's pretty simple. Um, it's hard, it could be hard to expand your brain initially, but I think, yeah, that should just be it. So we just write BFS normally, except we keep track of this extra thing. Cool, let's do it. So, okay. Um, all right, so. sure how much of this you can automate but whatever um, and vector int k negative actually let's let's do some infinity equals 29 for example and then that way we can do minimum easily that just it makes it more convenient in the end because otherwise like, we have to case handle negative ones which is kind of annoying so, okay, now we're never gonna touch this again. So now, q array int three, q, um, dist zero, zero, zero is equal to zero. And we push the initial state of zero, location zero, zero with zero obstacles removed. RC number of obstacles to be clear with what we're doing and let's go so while not q dot empty array int three current is equal to q dot front q dot pop uh, actually this should be k plus one because it goes from zero to k just worth noting so now Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is go in forward directions. So private constant dr4 is equal to 0, 0, negative 1, 1. Constant dc4, 0, 0. So four and d is equal to zero for each direction. Um, zero. So it's current dot first plus drd, current dot second plus dcd, and then current, no, current zero. I don't use arrays that often. Uh, current two. And so if if zero is less than next zero, so if it's within bounds and zero is less than equal to next one, and next one is less than n. So just if it's within bounds and If it's an obstacle, if grid next zero, next one is equal to one, then plus plus next two, because now we need to remove another obstacle. If next two is less than or equal to k, meaning if we still, even after removing this obstacle, we still have removed only at most k, then that's fine. 
then it's valid, so push it into the queue. If, okay, another if, just make sure that we haven't already visited this state. So if dist next zero, next one, next two is equal to negative one, then this distance is equal to dist current zero. You know, you may be confused by why I use one, le one letter variable names in my competitive programming stuff, but this is why, because this just sucks. So this is distance that plus one because we move an extra node, and then q.push next. And there we go. That's our BFS. So int answer is equal to inf, then four, int removed is equal to zero, removed is less than equal to k. And we're iterating over the number of obstacles removed. Um, answer is equal to min, answer dist m minus one, the, f the target cell plus this number of obstacles being removed. If answer is still infinity, that means we never reach the ending cell, so the answer should be negative one. Return answer. Okay, expecting a lot of compilers, but that's fine. Ah, actually a wrong answer. Okay, um, did I do everything right? So push this into the thing. It should be infinity, not negative one. I explicitly did that, and then I ignored myself. Also, I'm going to add this, go with two, just to make sure that we get that right. OK. Uh, all right. I don't think it's worth checking my code. Well, actually, you might as well. So we, I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't know what there is to check. Like if it's valid, if it's within bounds, if it's, Make sure I didn't swap M and N anywhere. Although we got through this case, so it's probably fine. If, yeah. Seems fine. Let's just do it. I don't care. If we get it wrong, whatever, we'll redo it. Nice, okay. Noticing my BFS is very slow, relatively, so that's fun. All right, we have here the second Facebook card, and nothing more. Let's start. Your music player has n different songs, and you want to listen to goal songs, not necessarily different during your trip. To avoid boredom, you'll create a playlist so that each song is played at least once. A song can only be played again only if k other songs have been played. Given n goal and k, return the number of possible playlists that you can create. Since the answer can be very large, return it modulo 10 to the 9th plus 7. Okay, so k is less than n. Is less than or equal to goal is less than or equal to 100. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 100 is small. So immediately small constraints and the fact that every song is equivalent, like there's no, there's nothing special about song number one. It's just one of the songs, and same for number two and number three. Is that um, this kind of screams DP? It's just kind of what I'm thinking. So let's say we've played. Okay, so what's so standard DP questions, what's important when we're at a particular state? When we've done, let's see, when we've done, so the first thing that matters, obviously, is the number of songs played overall, um, because that's that's just something we need. Right? So we need the number of songs played, but what else? We need the number of songs that are, like, we need the number of songs that have not been played. Or rather, okay, so this is the number of songs in the playlist. 
And this is the number of unique songs that have not been played yet. Handwriting. Uh, yeah. Number of unique songs that have not been played yet. But that's not it, because... So we know that, for example, let's say like k equals 3, n equals 4. We know that if we've played three songs, like 1, 2, 3, we know that these k songs are all going to be different. Because that's just kind of, that's just true. Um, these K songs are all different, and they're all already played. Because obviously, they're, they're literally in the playlist. So of the songs that have not been played yet, None of them, there's no intersection. This is a null intersection. Or rather, the number of unique songs that have not been played yet has no intersection with the recent K. Because, like, obviously, if they're in the recent K, they've been played. So what that means is the next song... I think I think that's it for the state. Yeah, I think that, that should be it for the state. So the next song that we play can either be So if it's already played some K songs ago, um, then it doesn't change, then it, it adds one to the playlist, but it doesn't change the number of unique songs. And if it's not been played, then it adds one to the playlist and it subtracts one to the number of unique songs not played yet. So that's cool. Um, and there are no other options. And I think that's it. The fact that the fact that there's no intersection between the K recent songs and the number of songs that haven't been played yet makes it really simple. Because mm -hmm. no matter what, the next song we're going to play is like is guaranteed to like if it's not in the why why does it make it simpler? Because like we don't have to worry about. If there's some unique song, then if it's in the K or not. Because what that means is, given only the, um, given only these two things, we can figure out exactly how many songs of the songs we can choose have not been played yet. So like there are three states, there are three states for a song. Either it's not played, it's in the recent K, or it's played not in recent K. And given only these two things, the number of songs in the playlist and the number of unique songs not played yet, that immediately gives us this number. And we can use this number in the playlist to figure out how many songs are in the recent K. It's either K or some number smaller than K. And that means to figure this number out, all we have to do is just, it's the total number of songs minus this minus this. So. These two songs, not played and played and not recent K, are what we can choose 
are what allow us to determine how many choices we have for this and how many choices we have for this. So when we're computing dp, we have to figure out these three numbers, and then we figure out how many choices we have for this. And that should be good. So OK. So let's code now. I think if this didn't make that much sense before, what I'm saying, it'll make more sense when we code it, I'm pretty sure. Because all I'm doing is I'm fleshing out the details for what we have to code. So vector auto dp, so vector vector int. So this is goal plus one, vector int, n plus one, zero. And the state is length of playlist and number of unique songs not yet played. So dp0, length of playlist 0, and having n songs left to play is equal to 1. So now, 4 int length is equal to 0, length is less than goal, length plus plus. So if our length is equal to goal, we're guaranteed to be done already. 4 int unplayed is equal to n. Iterate down because, like, we'll, our state can only go down. So, yeah. Our state can only go down. So greater than or equal to 0, unplayed, minus, minus. We're just iterating in the order that our state has to go in. Um, yeah. So let's see. Now, what we need to do is, again, we need to figure out these three values. int not played is equal to unplayed. So that's simple, actually. We already have unplayed. We're iterating over it. So int in recent is equal to the minimum of k and the length. Because if we haven't even played k songs left, then if we haven't even played k songs yet, then it's just however many songs we've played is in the recent k. And if we have already played more than k songs, then the in recent k is just k, because that's how many can be in recent k. So int, the final thing is played not, played unrecently. And I think that's a word, but whatever. Is equal to the total number of songs n minus unplayed minus in recent. Notice that these two things, again, are mutually disjoint, not mutually exclusive. There is no song that is both unplayed and in recent. Therefore, we can just subtract them normally. And now, there are two options. We play, we play a song that was already played. In which case we go from dp 0n to dp, or we go from dp length to dp length plus 1 because we add a song. So again, that's, that's this blue case, plus 1. And if we already played the song, then unplayed does not change. So it's simply unplayed is equal to... this plus dp length unplayed. So basically, we add our current state to the next state, mod mod. Another other choice is to play a song that was not played yet. And in that case, we add one to the length and subtract one from the songs that had not been played. So dp length plus one unplayed minus one is equal to that plus our current state, because we're going from our current state to that state. Uh, also, if unplayed is greater than 0. 
Also, I'm doing something wrong. We need to multiply by the number of options we have. Um, yeah. I think that should be it. Yeah. Okay. So this needs to be times the number of options. So the number of options we have for already played is played on recently because that's the number of songs we've we've already played that we can play again. So it's not in the recent cat. And this is the number of options we have for this is simply unplayed because that's what we're keeping track of. And that should be it. And then we return dp of, let's see. So it should be goal, songs have been played, and zero have been unplayed. Should work. OK, let's add a big test case so we can just um, So like 100, wait, what? End goal K, 75, 150. Let's just make sure we get the mod. Oh, shoot. I did not mean to do that, but OK. All right, that's fine. <laughs> I meant to run the example tests, but uh, yeah, I guess that's fine. OK, so this is Apple hard 2, and we have find in mountain array. Okay. So you may recall that an array R is a mountain array, if and only if. It's greater than or equal to 3. And it goes up, then goes down. OK, so we have, so yeah, the array elements should look like a mountain. And yeah, uh, given a mountain array, return the minimum index such that index is equal to target. If such an index does not exist, return negative 1. Cannot access the mountain array directly. We only get and find the length. Okay. So the submissions making more than 100 calls. We judge wrong answer. Also, any solutions that it's, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, up to 10 to the fourth, targets up to 10 to the ninth, index up to 10 to the ninth. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Okay. So if it was. If the mountain was like this, if it was just an up mountain, then we can easily just like binary search. Like, you know, we could just binary search standard. We can just do that. If it's too high, we go to the left. If it's too low, we go to the right or whatever, you know? Yeah. So we can do binary search on like a monotonic increasing array. And we could do the same for decreasing. But what we have here is we have an array that increases and then decreases. Um, so we have essentially two parts to this array, the increasing part and the decreasing part. So what if we could split it into two different parts? Ba-boom, like so. And then if we can find the part where it splits, if we can find the peak, then we'll have an increasing array, and then we'll have a decreasing array. And we can do binary search independently on those two parts. So that would work, um, but we have to find the peak. So how do we find the peak? Because we just how do how do we find the peak? Because we can't like we can't like easily binary search on the peak because it's kind of hard to do that. But I guess like what is log? Four over log two, that's fine. Okay, so we can do like seven log n, I guess. Um, if we could, okay, let's say we're doing binary search, and we have some estimate like mid. So the problem is like we don't know which side is which. Like, we can't tell the difference between mid being here and mid being here. Um, so we need more information. Um, how do we get more information? Maybe we could, like, 
Like, could we like ask for the slope? Like maybe we ask for like the next element to the right. And then that tells us if it's going up, then that means we're on the left side. And if it's going down, then that means we're on the right side. And then we need to do our binary search in such a way that the middle always stays in reach. Um, so we ask for slope. OK, actually, yeah, that should work. We, we ask for we ask for some middle element, and then we ask for the next element. OK, sure. So how do we? Well, what? How do we what? I guess that's it, right? We just do binary search. And when we when we figure out what the middle is, then we just, yeah, we just search for the slope. And then if it's going up, then that means that we know that we're on the left side of the array. So we have to make this our new range. Or rather this, I guess, include this element. Why did I pick white? So we include this element, I guess. And then if we're on the right side, then we need to keep the middle in. So we do that. That should work. OK. Sure. So OK, so once we have the peak, then that's simple. We just do two independent binary searches on the increasing and decreasing parts. OK. Um, okay, so first thing we do is find peak. So we find the peak on just the mountain array. And it's equal to mountain r dot length. <coughs> Now, find the peak. So what we do is int l is equal to 1, r is equal to n minus 1. Because we know that 0 and the last index can't be the valid like peaks. So inclusive, exclusive. This, is, this all depends on how you write binary search. I do it this way where the left end is inclusive and the right end is exclusive. So that's why it's n minus 1 and not n minus 2. So m is equal to l plus r over 2, standard stuff. <coughs> so int uh, mountain r dot get m, 0 indexed, right? Yeah. Okay, int, and we ask to the right, get m plus 1. This is guaranteed to be in bounds because of how I wrote my binary search. So if m val is less than m right, that means that we're at this case, which means that we're on the, so we should move l is equal to m plus 1. because it should be inclusive. And otherwise, there's only one other option. It's less, so L R is equal to M. Then return L. Uh, return find peak. OK, let's just, that's not going to be the right answer, but I just want to see and make sure it gets the right thing. So it should be 3 and 3, 4 and 3. Why? What? Oh, five. Yep, four and three. Okay. 
Cool. So that was simple. Um, Car. So int peak is equal to find peak. So now we just binary search on the left and binary search on the right. So int on left. So int l is equal to zero. R is equal to peak plus one because it should be inclusive. So while l is less than r. So we're writing three binary searches, which is cool. Um, int val is equal to mountain r dot get m. If val is equal to target, well, let's not. Um, yeah, if val is less than target, that can be risky. If val is less than target, then that means that we're on the, means that like our targets here and we're over here, which means that our middle needs to be raised, our, our interval needs to be to the left, so L is equal to M plus one, else R is equal to M. So now if val is less than target, yeah. Okay, so if Let's fiddle with the test cases a bit. So if, yeah, so if mountain r dot get l is equal to target, return l. Otherwise, we do peak r is equal to n. And then we do the binary search on the decreasing part, the this part. So if bow is greater than target, then basically just inverse the conditions. Alright, equals M. on all of them, seems good. So it finds it on the left and the right, so binary search works and finding the peak works. And I guess that's it, right? I mean, there's nothing else I could do. Seems legit. Okay. Runtime error. Assertion zero is less than equal to index, and index is less than n. Oh, it goes out of bounds. Why? Oh, if l is less than n. Yeah, I forgot about that, because sometimes it could converge to that. That is true, okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, well, that was a dumb mistake, but I guess it's fine. Okay, so here is Amazon hard two, and you are given nums, an array of positive integers of size 2n. You must perform n operations. In the ith operation, you will choose two elements, receive a score of i times the GCD of two elements, or those two elements, and remove the elements. I'm going to return 
the maximum score after n operations. Okay. And oh, and it's seven. Okay, that makes a big difference. So n is seven. That means we can basically do brute force. But like not like brute force, brute force. But I mean we could. But like we can. Okay, the fact that it's so small, like, like the only valid, the only possible valid solution for n being so small is like some sort of bitmass dp. That's literally the only thing I can think of that applies to this situation with these constraints. So if you're wondering how I came up with this, it's just because n is so small that there has to be a bitmass dp solution or brute force. But bitmass dp seems like it applies here. So it's, it's a bit better than brute force. So if we keep a mask, so let's say we have, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six. If we keep a mask of which elements are still in the array, and then let's say, for example, remove four, six, then we update the mask by removing four and six from the mask. So the ith bit, equals is i in array. And then, yeah, this should just be very standard bitmass dp. We just, um, at each choice, we iterate over which things we're going to remove. And we do that. So this, yeah, this should be fine. Should be like two to the two n times n squared, which is fine for two n equals fourteen. So we just iterate over which ones we remove. We add it to the score, and yeah. So dp of mask equals best score for mask, answer is dp0, since that's what happens after we remove all the elements. And yeah, at each point, we just check which ones we remove. OK, seems simple enough. So vector constant in physical number 9. Uh, that should be fine, right? Times a sixth, yeah. So. Uh, vector int dp int n equals nums dot size. Let's not mess with unsigned integers here. So two to the n, one bit shifted by n is two to the n. Look that up. Uh, and negative infinity. But dp of two to the n minus one is equal to zero. Okay, now. I is equal to 2 to the n minus 1, i minus minus. No, i is greater than equal to 0. I, I, I've done that like more often than I should have. I, I switched the order of these two statements, and that's really dumb. Um, OK, so first things first, int num bits set is equal to this function. Or basically, we're counting the number of bits that have been set. If it's even, because we can't ever be at a state where we have odd, where we have an odd number of bits set, since like we start off with even, and at every point we set two bits from we set two bits that are one to zero. So at every at every point, the number of bits that are set have to be even. So we could like we could not do this, but we could also do it. Like you don't have to do this because things are negative infinity. It will work if you don't do this, but I'm just gonna do it because I might as well. And also, we might as well not go to zero since we can just like we don't have to do that. Yeah, since if we go to zero, we can't do anything from zero anyway. I'm doing push DP, so that's fine. Okay, so. For int 
the first bit we remove, j is less than n, j two times n, no wait, okay, we're doing, um, n is going to be the number of bits in the mask, not the n from this. Clarity, okay, I hit control S. J is less than N, J plus plus. If, um, if the J bit is set, so if, let's do, let's call this mask. I think that's better. We can call this I. If mask this is just the thing we shift it right i bits so that the ith bit is the one in the position one and then we end it with one so that we this is just this is standard bitwise stuff um, I'll, I'll just explain that really quick so we say for example we have one one zero one and we want the we want bit if, if these bits are numbered like three, two, one, zero, and we want bit number two, then we shift it right two, so that it becomes, um, so it becomes this, and then zero, zero, and then we end it with one, so that this bit is isolated and everything else becomes zero. So now the only bit that's active is this bit, so that's the bit we check. And that, that checks if the ith bit is set in mask. That's just a, a common trick we use for bitmask DP. So if this bit is set, then we iterate over the next bit, i plus i plus one, j is less than n. Do the exact same thing. Mask shift of j and one. J bit is set. Then these are the two bits we have, so Wait, nums.size is 2n. Okay, I'm being dumb. Um, so int g is equal to gcd of nums i and nums j. Int new mask equal to mask. New mask minus equals i. We can do x or equals. So that will set the ith bit to zero, since xor will make it the opposite, and since it's one, it'll be zero. New mask x or equal one two to the j. I don't need that comment, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, dp new mask is equal to max dp new mask and dp mask plus g. Since we're going from this state mask to the new mask and we gain g points in the process. Finally, return dp zero. One, seven, six, okay. Oh, uh, we need Okay, int, we need to compute the turn because I'm computing the cost wrong. Int turn is equal to n minus the number of bits that have been set divided by two plus one. So that's saying if we have all the bits set, then we're on turn one. If we have two bits that are unset, or rather int num bits, unset. So this will compute the number of bits that are unset. Then we do that. Now turn is the number of bits that have been set to zero divided by two because we set two at a time and then plus one because it's one indexed. So yeah, that should be good now. Nope. 
because uh, I didn't use it. Note to self. Don't be dumb. Did that? That didn't. That didn't do it. Okay. So use the turn. Read the statement correctly. Get the right answer. Submit. Get accepted. Be happy. Right? Right. Okay. Cool. Okay, this is the second Google hard and the last hard question of the set. Um, okay, very simple statement. Given an unsorted integer array nums, return the smallest missing positive integer. You must implement an algorithm that runs in O of n time and uses constant extra space. Constant, okay, so that's very restrictive. O of n time, so we cannot sort. Constant extra space, so we cannot make an auxiliary array. Um, and it's up to 5v5, numbers are big, okay. Okay, so, so what? So what? Um, so the only thing I see here is constant extra space, but we do have O of n space that we can use. which is the array itself. So if we can somehow take, a, take advantage of the O of n space we get from the array to, if we can, yeah, if we can take advantage of this extra space and then use that to figure out our answer, then that'd be cool. But how do we do that? Um, so we want the smallest missing positive integer. So of note, the only things that matter, only the only ones that matter, are one to n. Because anything less, less than or equal to zero will not matter because it's not a positive integer. And anything greater than n will not matter. Because suppose we have n plus 1 in our array. Then that means, by pigeonhole principle, we have n minus 1 slots left. And for the, we have n minus 1 slots left, which means we cannot put all 1 to n integers in this array. Which means that the smallest positive integer is going to be less than or equal to n, or the smallest missing positive integer is going to be less than or equal to n, which means that n plus 1 doesn't matter. Anything greater than n doesn't matter, because if something is greater than n, that implies that we have n minus 1 slots left to store 1 to n, which is impossible, so that means that the smallest missing integer is less than or equal to n. So anything greater than n doesn't matter because if there's something greater than n, it implies that this will be less than or equal to n, which means that this doesn't matter. So the existence of this integer means that it doesn't matter. So 1 to n, right? So if we only care about 1 to n, um, what if we like, what if we, if we only care about 1 to n, why don't we use the slots 1 to n of our array to store that? Uh, so let's 1 to index our array, for example. So let's say like 1, 2, 3, 4, index. And initially we have 3, 4, negative 1, 1. This is the second sample. So what if we could do some swaps in our array to make it so we have... 1, negative 1, 3, and 4. So we try to match the value 1 with the index 1. We try to match the value 3 with the index 3 and 4 with 4. That got messy really quick. But yeah. Um, so if we could do that, then the answer is trivial. We just find the first index that's not equal to its value. Um, and this, all we do is swap some elements around in the array. So we use, we, we use constant extra space 
And if we can do it quickly, then we can do it in O of n time. Um, but how do we do it in O of n time? I guess we can, it's kind of like, okay, it's kind of like a permutation. It's like a messed up permutation. So we can like, if we go through the array, um, we could say, like, let's, uh, same color. Let's iterate through. And if we see a three, then let's move it to index three. And then we'll swap it with whatever um, isn't in three. We'll swap it with whatever is already in that index. And that way we, we, we don't use any extra space. We just move some elements around. So we can swap these two things. We put negative one here, three, one. And then now we're here. Now we move four to index four. And then negative one, one, three, four. Now here's where the tricky part is. Um, this has to be a while loop because now notice that we've moved one to this to this position. So if we go through each index exactly once, then we'll skip this one. Because now if we iterate here, we'll see the three and four are correct, but we won't have one in the correct spot. So this has to be a while loop. Um, I feel like a lot of people are going to get that wrong. But yeah, so this has to be, while we have something here, um, that's like, while we have something here in the range 1 to n, then swap it and move it to its correct position. But this has to be a while because, again, if we only look at this 4 and we swap it with the 1, and then we move on without considering that the 1's here, then we're going to leave this 1 here and we're going to be wrong. So we have to do like, while something is between 1 to n, we move it to its correct position. I think that's it. We just iterate through the array, swap elements. This is like, it's very similar to like permutation algorithms because this is, this is it, it, actually it's the exact same as the permutation algorithm. It's like the, the, the algorithm to like sort out a permutation in O of n based on like its cycles and stuff. Like this is exactly what we would do. So I think, I think it should be fine. Yeah, okay. Sure. So code is very simple. For int i equals zero, i is less than nums dot size i plus plus. So while nums i is not equal to i and nums i is between one and n. then move it to its correct position. So nums swap nums i, and the index is nums i, but minus one because we're zero indexing in this array. So this should actually be while nums i minus one is equal to i, is not equal to i. Then four int i equals zero is less than nums that size plus plus. If nums i minus one is not equal to i, then return num return i plus one. So if one's missing from index one, or rather index zero, then one is missing. So that's it. And yeah, otherwise return n plus one. It's very simple. But again, the important part is this while loop. Because if, if this is an if, then, then again, we'll miss this. We'll miss this case. We'll miss the one being here, and we'll um, screw ourselves over. Seems legit. I think we should be good. Um, time limit exceeded. 
Oh. Okay. While loop is screwing me over. Um. Crap. That's a problem. Uh. Okay. Simple hacky fix. And nums i just to just to fix this exact bug if these are not equal then we should swap them because if they're equal then we'll be screwed okay <laughs> dumb fix but okay yeah i think oh damn um why Oh my god, are you serious? Wait, what? Why, why is... Wait, no, that's... yeah, okay. Wait, no. This doesn't make sense. Why, why is that happening? Because that shouldn't even be a thing. It shouldn't get past this. What's happening? I don't understand. But why? So, nums, nums i minus one. What am I, what am I messing up here? And nums i is not equal to Oh, 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 oh. Okay. I'm dumb. It's happening here, not here. Okay. Okay. That is a that is a niche bug. Holy crap. But yeah, okay. That should be good now. Um, okay, if if overflow wasn't a runtime error, it would work anyway, because this would just overflow to like int max and it would not satisfy this condition. So it wouldn't really matter, but okay, whatever. Sure, sure, it's fine. <sighs> I don't learn, do I? No, I do not. So if one is greater than numsi, you could swap these around, but whatever. Yeah, okay. I really don't learn. Okay, is this the only, okay, let's check again. So this is overflow guarded, this is overflow guarded, this is overflow guarded, this is now overflow guarded, and there should be nothing else. This should work. Okay. Good. Fun. Again, if Lico didn't have overflow being a runtime error, this would work, but fine. All right, so as for the questions themselves, I would say that I'm impressed by the lack of mistakes for how little I was checking my code throughout, because I only failed three out of the 24 questions on the first attempt. And most of it came down to edge cases, so that's kind of a note to myself to pay more attention to those. But other than that, not much more to say about the questions. This video itself was kind of experimental, but it's also very similar to the topic streams I've done in the past, where the goal is to just create a comprehensive tutorial for a bunch of problems related to a particular subject. And I hope it did just that. It's designed so you're supposed to try out the questions for yourself first, but if you didn't or you're just here because it's popped up on your recommended feed, 
then I don't know, maybe you got something out of this too? I don't really know. I don't have much more to say here. So that's all. Goodbye.